Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? Hopefully, okay. Um, all right, my name is Sam Sivakumar. I work at Intel. Um, I, as uh, Anish mentioned, I started working there in 1990 after uh, getting a W degree from uh, University of Illinois. Um, so I've worked in lithography pretty much my entire career. Uh, so I've got to see how the technology has evolved over the years. Uh, and hopefully I can touch upon some of that stuff uh, over the course of this talk. And I've got a 9.30 p.m. flight out of town, so I'll be around for a while. So if anybody wants to you know, talk to me after the, uh, after the presentation, that's fine. Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So, um, so this is a very broad subject. So um, I, based on the f input I got from Anish, um, I'm assuming that you have, you, you have some background or you've been um, in that as, as part of your class you've had uh, some exposure to the different orthographic techniques that are out there. Um, so I'm going to assume you know some of the basics, uh, at least some, some terms that, uh, uh, that I'll uh, refer to. If you don't, just raise your hand. We can go over it in a little bit more detail. OK, so you know, Moore's Law is this um, uh, statement that uh, relates um, how uh, how the semiconductor uh, industry, uh, you know, ec is economically feasible, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it dictates how by doubling the um, number of transistors you can pack onto a chip every, you know, year and a half or a couple of years, you're able to maintain this dollar per transistor number. Uh, you make it go down, and so you're able to provide more capabilities to the the end user, to the customer, right? So, so over the course of, you know, the last. 30 years or more, you know, the dollar per transistor value has gone down. And the reason that has happened is because you can pack more and more transistors onto a piece of silicon. Um, so you know, obviously, in order to do that, you, be, you have to be able to print things smaller and smaller, because you can't simply make the chip bigger. The chip is roughly the same size over the course of uh, those years. Um, so lithography really is sort of the engine that drives um, uh, Moore's law. That, that enables us to make these feature sizes smaller and smaller. Um, and so, you know, the economic benefit, of course, is that you're able to provide much more capability in a cell phone today than you had in a supercomputer, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, but, of course, the technical challenge goes up proportionally. It's a lot, it's really hard to make these features small. Um, so, if you look at, you know, the 22 nanometer technology is what what is in the marketplace right now? I have it all the way at the right end of the page. Um, 90 nanometers came out in 2003. Um, and then every two years, roughly, we've been trying to get a new process technology out in the market. Um, so every one of these generations had some new innovation, either in the transistor or in the way you wired the transistors and so on. So, and of course, the feature sizes get smaller every generation. So the 22 nanometer, the last column there, uh, that really represents the state of the art in the marketplace today. And so we're, we're starting, we're, we're actually not starting, we're, we're working on 14 nanometers, which is the next node after that. And there's already some research work going on in the 10 nanometer node, which is the one beyond that. So a fair amount of work that's, uh, that is past that page. It'll probably come out in the next two to four years. Um, so if you look at these two plots, what I've shown here is a feature size over time. And on the right-hand side uh, is the, the area of an SRAM cell, a basic memory cell, uh, as a function of time. And so this is a log plot. So uh, basically, the, the feature sizes get smaller by 0.7x every generation, every two years. You know, you try to shrink the feature sizes by you know, 30%. And so your area goes down by half every two years, right? Because it's the square of that. So, that really represents you know, how you're able to pack more and more transistors onto a chip, twice as many transistors every year. Um, and you know, the, so you can see the, you know, the, the SRAM cell has evolved considerably over the course of you know, multiple process generations. So um, this is an interesting picture I like to show. You know, in 1978, uh, a contact, which is this, you know, Again, if you raise your hand if you don't know what a contact is, but a contact is a connection between two metal layers. It's a vertical sort of uh, uh, connection. And so that, that was what a contact looked like. And so you can pack 
10, 32 nanometer memory cells inside one single contact from you know 1978. So it just it graphically illustrates you know how how much smaller features are now uh, compared to where they were you know just a short time ago. So you know from a lithography standpoint, you're, in order to make things smaller, there are a lot of things that need to happen. You're electrically, your transistor has got to get smaller. Your wires, you have to understand how the resistance and capacitance of your wires change over, over process generations. But from a lithographer standpoint, our goal <coughs> is to develop patterning solutions to continue this trend in the most cost-effective way possible. You know, and, and a cost is a recurring theme I'll, I'll harp upon over the course of my talk. Uh, but lithography is the most expensive process step in the fab. You know, right now, I, you know, estimates go from anywhere to 40 to 50 percent of the total cost of making a chip is lithography. You know, so there's a lot of effort that goes into trying to understand where all the money is going and figuring out how to do your lithography cheaper, uh, you know, less expensive in a less expensive way. So you obviously want to keep the trend. You don't want to slow that down. But at the same time, you're trying to understand how do you do it with, you know, with the, in the most cost-effective way possible. So that's really you know, the lithographer's mission is not just to figure out technically how to make things smaller, but how to do it cheaply. Right. Um, so before I jump into some of the, tech, some of the uh, details, I just have one slide that talks about you know, the, how conventional lithography is done. So this is a. Uh, you know, a scanner uh, which uses uh, optical uh, lithography. You know, it's, it's light that comes in, the green lines there. There's a mask that has your features, uh, and the mask will diffract the light that comes in. So you have different diffracted orders. You have the first order, you have the second order, and so on. So obviously, the zeroth order, which comes straight through, has no spatial information in it. If you think about a Fourier series, uh, the zeroth order has no sp spatial information. You have to capture at least the first order, the sinusoidal. You know, the, f the first order has to be captured by your lens in order to figure out you know, if, you have a, if you have a grading lines and spaces on your mask in order to uh, um, capture the periodicity of the, of the features you're trying to print, you've got to capture at least the first order. So that kind of defines how big your lens needs to be. So the lens literally has to be big enough to capture the first order. And, and so the relationship there on the right-hand side, you know, sine theta equals m lambda over d, what it says is that uh, the angle of diffraction of your first order, or, or higher order, depending on which uh, diffractor order we're talking about, uh, is obviously you know, a function of your wavelength, and it's inversely proportional to the size you're trying to define. So the smaller the feature size, the, the more the diffraction angle, and so the bigger lens you need. So one of the things that has happened over multiple process generations is your lenses have to get bigger and bigger and bigger to print smaller sizes, right? Um, and so that defines how complicated your scanner is. And so a huge amount of technical know-how goes into making these giant lenses uh, that have extremely low aberrations, you know, very, very high quality. Um, so uh, there's this equation known as the Raleigh equation. You guys may have seen it as part of your course, uh, which relates your feature size you can define is proportional to your wavelength. And it's inversely proportional to the numerical aperture of your lens, which is really the, how big the lens is. Right? Uh, so the bigger your lens, the smaller the feature size you can define. The lower the wavelength you use, the smaller the feature size you can define. And the proportionality constant, K1, it's really a um, a metric of how difficult your lithography is, right? So typically, what you, you know, in, 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 from a practical standpoint, if you're going to have a factory that's making these chips, the K1 needs to be about 0.3 or so, not a whole lot smaller than 0.3. So that kind of defines what's this, you know, given a wavelength and a numerical aperture, that defines how small a feature size you can practically define. You try to print features that are smaller than that, and you're going to get a lousy process. It's not going to do very well in a factory. So this plot here, I, I've shown here as half pitch, which is you know, the feature size you can roughly uh, imagine if you're printing equal lines and spaces. So that's on the x-axis. And then k1 is that proportionally constant on the y-axis. So I drew a line, a horizontal white line, that says anything below that is, is no good for manufacturing. Anything above that's OK. Right? And so these lines here, the red line, the blue line, and the green line that, that's running across the graph, those represent 
um, basically k1 for a given set of lambda and na. So the first one is point eight, the, the red one is 0.85 na. So your na is 0.85 and the lambda is uh, argon fluoride which is 193 nanometer light, right? So those two numbers are fixed and you just plot basically k1 versus d. And what this says is that for this kind of lithography where you have a lens that's 0.85 na, the size of the lens is 0.85 na and you're using 193 nanometer illumination, you really can't print features that are s smaller than about 70 nanometers, right? You're not, it's not going to do very well if you're trying to run a factory. So in order to do, go to smaller feature sizes, you've got to jump up a little bit, maybe to 0.93 NA, right? So that's, that's the next step. So these are actually the, the types of scanners that have been on the marketplace. 0.85 NA is kind of an old machine. You know, we don't even use it anymore. Um, the 0.93 NA machine is probably the, uh, the oldest machine that we practically use on the RF side. The next big step, so if, if you look here, uh, in 2005, for the 65 nanometer node, we used the 0.85 NA machine. So the feature sizes were about 100 nanometers, and it did pretty well. You know, we were well above this white line. When we moved to the 45 nanometer node, we, we were okay. We just, the 0.93 NA tools had just come out, so we skipped, we moved on to that. When we went to 32, it was clear that uh, had we stayed on those old tools, we would have fallen below, you know, the, the, right here, we would have fallen below that white line. So we had to move up to 1.35 NA, which is uh, something called an immersion scanner. You know, we use water uh, between the lens and the wafer to improve your resolution. So we jumped up there, and then what, 22 nanometers, we're still sort of right around 0.3, so we, we managed to make this work with uh, 1.35 NA ARF. So, again, you know, if you want to reduce D, you know, you can get to bigger lenses, you can reduce the wavelength, or figure out a way to run at lower K1. So this 0.3, can you challenge this 0.3 number? You know, can you really try to run lower than that? So there are lots of tricks one can use try to run as close as possible to the white line and maybe even below it. Uh, so those are the kinds of, you know, development activities that we have to do um, uh, to come up with uh, a lithography operating point that can print the feature sizes we need. The problem we run into, of course, is that, you know, on ARF, 1.35 NA represents the highest numerical aperture you can practically make. You know, it, it's, it's a function of a lot of different things. It's a function of the refractive index of the, of the water, of the glass you use, and so on. So there are ways to get around it, but they're not very practical. So for all intents and purposes, 1.35 NA is the, is the maximum NA possible. And what, what you can see here is, this is the NA. So the, the numerical aperture has gone up from about 0.35 to 0.4, all the way up to 1.35. There's really no more room to go up. Uh, and at the same time, you've been dropping your wavelength from 436 to 365 to 248 to 193. So this combination now, 193 nanometer light with a 1.35 NA, that represents the state of the art. That's as far as ARF lithography is going to go. So that kind of defines a floor for the feature sizes you can define, below which it's simply not possible to use conventional ARF lithography. Um, so the next big step is to find another wavelength, right? So this, you know, there's EUV is the next big lithography uh, node that's out there. And, and that's quite a big step in, in wavelength. You go to 13 and a half nanometers, all the way from 193 nanometers. So, uh, so you get a lot of resolution, but along with that comes a huge you know, a number of challenges. EUV lithography is horrendously complicated, and I'll really spend a lot of time I'm talking about that. Um, so it, it, EUV is really the, the main area of uh, research and development focus right now in lithography out there. So the lithography scaling problem, going back again to the, um, to the Raleigh equation, is you know, to reduce D, I just, I'm kind of repeating what I had in my previous slide. You can increase NA, but of course there you got a problem because the maximum NA of 1.35 we already hit. You can reduce the wavelength. The problem there is EUV, like I said, is extremely complicated and it has been delayed. You know, we're doing our best to get it into manufacturing, but it's proving to be far more difficult than uh, you know, anybody could have imagined. 
Um, so a lot of effort also is now going into figuring out how to make ARF lithography work. You know, are there tricks we can do in lithography? Uh, you know, uh, the, the source and the mask uh, with the wafer. You know, I'll talk about things like pitch division. And then are there non-optical approaches? Multiple e-beam direct right can use e-beam lithography to, to pattern features. Uh, nano imprint, directed self-assembly. There are all these other techniques that are being uh, investigated. A lot of these are pretty in a pretty rudimentary state in, as far as uh, their, um, as far as how soon you think you can get it into manufacturing. So probably a few years to go uh, to to get those in a manufacturable state. So I think one of the key things is your, your traditional scaling approach, which has consistently been make the lens bigger, drop the wavelength when you need to. You know that that's run out of steam. So we really need to think about other things uh, to continue scaling. So what are the challenges in, in scaling feature size? Um, when you think about you know, the Raleigh equation and all this, so lithography from a very theoretical standpoint, uh, you think of equal lines and spaces. You think of printing a grading. You know, a lot of the analyses that are done, like the graphs I showed, talk about you know, printing lines and spaces, which is great. If all we had to do was to print lines and spaces, then it makes lithography a whole lot easier. Right? The problem is a real layout looks like that. You have lines and spaces here and there, but you have all kinds of other things. You have these end-to-end -end structures. You have these two ends that face each other. Very, very difficult to pattern. You have different line widths. It's not a constant grading from one end to the other. You have narrow lines. You have wide lines. You have routing that goes both ways, some horizontal, some vertical. Right? And then you have all kinds of bends. You have all these weird features that don't always want to pattern very well. Yeah, so gradings are really easy to scale, relatively easy to scale, I should say. Real layouts are not. Real layouts are really hard to scale. So a lot of challenge really goes into figuring out how to manage la real layouts and make them suitable for, for scaling, make them uh, lithography friendly, so to speak. So the solution there, you know, sounds simple, uh, is let's make everything look like a grading, right? So this is what layouts used to look like at 65 nanometers, the real circuit, you know, on a, on a microprocessor. And what we did going to 45 nanometers so is really try to figure out how to rearrange these transistors to make it look like that. So this is what a printed wafer looks like. These are gates, transistor gates. Here's a, you can kind of see the isolation underneath. So each one of these, this is a transistor there, it's a transistor there. Um, so it's a lot more regular, a uh, lot more like a grading. It's not perfectly a grading, but it's a whole lot better to pattern than this thing here. So a huge, it took a huge amount of effort, huge amount of collaboration with our design groups and the fab, the lithography guys to figure out how do you make, how do you go from here to there without giving up density? You know, you don't, you, if, if you did that and then your chip got twice as big, that's no good. Right? So you have to be able to do this kind of thing without sacrificing density. And so it's, it's a mindset change in a lot of different ways for designers, for the tools that lay out circuits, uh, and for lithography itself. Uh, but we may, may, made that happen. Like 40, this is what circuits these days look like. Uh, and that's the way they're going to look like, because it's a whole lot easier to pattern that than this. So unidirectional gridded layouts are the way of the future. You know, once again, this is 65 nanometers. You can see here, this is a diffusion. These are transistors. These are gates that go across. So each one of these is a transistor. And that's what a circuit looks like at 45 nanometers. Real uniform, single pitch. Uh, you do have the cuts. We have to figure out how to do that. But for the most part, it looks a lot more like a grading than this thing. So the goal in lithography now is try to figure out how do you make a layout look, make a grading, and then cut the grading. Right? So you've got a grading and a cut. So the the, the a lot, of, a lot of effort that we're trying to do is working with the designers to figure out how do you take any circuit layout and turn it into something like this, where you can lay down a grading, which we know how to do reasonably well, and then figure out how to cut it, which is a little bit harder to do, but at least you get rid of a lot of the uh, problem layouts that uh, some of the uh, earlier uh, technologies had. So, you know, 
from this point forward, I'll talk about these two challenges. You, you have uh, the first challenge is figuring out how to print a tight grading, and the second challenge is to figure out how to cut the grading in the right places to make a real layout. And it turns out that these are two very different lithographic um, uh, patterning problems. Okay. So I go back to this graph, and real, here we really we're talking about the grading itself. All these, you know, uh, Raleigh equation, all that. This very idealized uh, case uh, where we're talking about printing equal lines and spaces. So we 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 said that at 32, we went from 0.93 NA lithography to this immersion lithography, which is at 1.35, and then we stayed there for 22, for 14 nanometers, which is going to come out into the market next year. We're going to move up to, we're going to stay with 1.35 in ARF because there's really nothing else on ARF side. But we're going to do something called pitch halving, and we'll talk about that. And you might have encountered this uh, as I'll show this, some of the cartoons. You, you, I'm sure you would have seen it in your class. Uh, so the standard way, because as you can see, at these kinds of pitches, you know, the mid 20s, so the pitch of 40, 40, between 40 and 50, you can't stay on this yellow line anymore. You've got to jump up to the green line. And so that's what we're intending to do for 14. And then moving forward for 10, which we have started work on right now, you know, about, it's been about six to eight months, we've started work on uh, the 10 nanometer node, which is going to come out in 2015. Even that's not going to be good enough. You know, we, we can't be there. We got to jump up there. So it's either EUV, which is the brown line, or the magenta line is pitch quartering, and we'll talk about that as well. So there's different techniques to extend uh, ARF lithography, pitch halving and pitch quartering. So this is pitch halving, and the idea is, you know, as, as the term says, you know, how do you cut your pitch in half, right? So a couple of different ways you can do it, you know, one of them is this so-called double patterning, which is, you know, you have those um, bluish lines that's at twice the pitch you're finally interested in getting. You etch that into the green uh, film, you know, whatever, there's some kind of a mask, some kind of hard mask film. Uh, then you coat some photoresist and create your second pattern and you interleave them. And then you transfer the composite pattern into your substrate. So you, in effect, you're doing two combs at twice the pitch you're interested in and then stick them, you know, interleave them so that you get the final pitch you want. So this is the final pitch that you desire, which is impossible to print, you know, by itself. But of course, you can print twice the pitch twice and then mix them up. You know, so that's one approach. The other approach is the spacer-based pitch division, which it really turns out to be a lot more powerful and a lot more elegant way to do things. And this is really the way most of most uh, semiconductor manufacturers do pitch division. So what you do is, again, you start with a pattern that's twice the pitch you're interested in. And then you deposit this conformal film you know, that kind of goes around your original pattern. Then you do a very directional etch, which etches perfectly vertical. So the, the the film and the flat regions go away, leaving behind these spacers. And then you get rid of your original pattern, giving you the twice the pitch. You know, it's probably, I'm sure you've seen these cartoons before. So this is pitch halving. So essentially, you get half the pitch that you started off with. Right? So um, it turns out that this is not that complicated to do in the fab. You know, there's a lot of details, but you know, from a um, uh, difficulty standpoint, or even a cost standpoint, it, this, uh, these extra process steps do add cost, but not terribly so. Uh, the advantage of this method, of course, is you only need one lithography exposure to do this, your original pattern. Right? Here you need two exposures, the first comb and then the second comb, and you've got to put them together. So this turns out to be much more expensive than that. And so since cost is king in lithography, this technique actually is preferred by just about everybody. So the advantage, of course, is that you, know, you get a huge boost in your pitch for essentially very little effort, right? or relatively little effort. Um, and so your graphs, you know, or your, the half pitch that you can do at any given numerical aperture, any, for, the, for a given size of lens that you have, you can do essentially half the pitch that you could otherwise. So ARF pitch division, right? You do have process complexity. You've got to figure out how to deposit these films and etch them and clean them up and all that. 
but you gain significant resolution at the expense of process complexity. So that's the trade-off that you have. Um, here are some slides showing this, you know, the, the first approach, which is the interleaved uh, two, two pitches approach. So you do your first lithography, you somehow freeze that pattern, right? So you can do a lot of different techniques. You can use bakes, you can use uh, um, uh, ion implant. You can use a lot of different ways by which you freeze that pattern. And then you come back and interleave the second pattern in between the, those gaps. And then um, you can you know, basically develop that out and you get your composite pattern which you can, etch in, which you can then etch into your substrate. And here are some examples of you know, this so-called litho freeze litho etch. So there's, so there's a litho step and then you freeze the pattern, you put your second lithography step and then you etch the total pattern into substrate. So here are some examples of features that have been double pattern and you kind of kind of see it qualitatively you got these two uh, lines that are at different height so this was done with your first pattern and then you came back and put your second pattern here and interleave them and then now you can transfer this thing into substrate and you can get reasonably good lines and spaces uh, or even contact holes using these techniques Now spacer-based pitch division is the other technique which really is you know, turning out to be the preferred approach. Uh, so again, you start with this you know, pattern that's you know, twice the pitch, you put the spacer around and then you etch the spacer, so that's what you have there. And then you get rid of your, you know, the, the pattern in between, so that's gone. These are the spacers that are left behind there. And then now you can etch that into a substrate and end up with a pitch that's half of what you started off with. So now you can take this technique and extend it another time, right? So if you take this pitch having you end up here, now you put your second film on top of it and then you can end up with a pitch that's a fourth of what you started with. So that's kind of describes in this column here. You start with that yellow pattern, <coughs> the blue line, is the first spacer, you etch the first spacer here, get rid of that yellow thing, uh, and then you're left with this. You put a second f spacer on top of it, etch that, you get that and get rid of the blue and you end up with this. Right? So in theory, you could do this as many times as you want. So you have pitch halving, quartering, you can go to you know, one eighth the pitch and stuff like that. And there are tricks, there are slightly different flows, you can get to a sixth of the pitch you started off with. So these are tricks that you can use, you're cheating really. I mean, you're, you don't have better lithography, but you're able to get pitches that are quite a bit tighter than you would otherwise.